Hello, it's Nikki going. Welcome to session five of our discussions on the Crucible. Today we'll be discussing Act Two of the Crucible. And as you know, before you get started on an act, it's important that you answer the question for yourself, what actually happens in the act? So get the plot straight in your head before you carry on. I'll briefly summarize for you. So just to refer back to Act One, Act One could be thought of as Abigail's act because in Act 1 we focus on how and why Abigail gained her power in Salem. Uh, the preconditions and motives for the witchcraft, sorry, witchcraft trials are also established in Act 1 and we see that John Proctor has very strong feelings for Abigail and that to a certain extent Abigail still controls John Proctor and his emotional responses. In Act 2, there is a very big shift, and in fact, in many ways, Act 2 is a contrast to Act 1, because Act 2 can be considered to be Elizabeth's act. In Act 2, we focus on Elizabeth's relationship with John Proctor as she tries to wrestle control away from Abigail. We focus on Abigail's growing power in Salem, and it's quite ironic that as her power over Salem increases, her power over John Proctor and Elizabeth Proctor and Elizabeth Proctor in terms of their relationship decreases, although she is able to increasingly cause them harm. And then John Proctor starts to see, see Abigail for who she is, and he realizes his love for Elizabeth. So the plot of Act 2, very briefly, is, um, first of all, remember that the events in Act 2 happen eight days, only eight days after Tituba, Abigail, and Betty first cried out against witchcraft. It starts off with incredible tension between Proctor and Elizabeth. Then Mary Warren comes in and she gives Elizabeth a little doll or poppet as a gift. Mary Warren explains that she has been at the court in Salem and that many more women have been arrested. She describes Sarah Good's pregnancy and confession and explains why Goody Osborne is going to hang. After playing power games with the Proctors, Mary goes to bed. Elizabeth then realizes that Abigail wants her dead. The Proctors argue about John's supposed promise to Abigail. Hale arrives and questions the Proctors. The Proctor, Proctor tells Hale that Abigail had said that witchcraft had never actually happened, that what they were doing in the forest was only sporting. And Giles Corey and Francis Nurse arrive and they describe how their wives have now been charged with witchcraft. Cheva, the court bailiff, then arrives. He questions the proctors, and he discovers the poppet that Mary Warren had given to Abigail. Mary Warren explains why Elizabeth has the, proper, the poppet, and Elizabeth loses her temper and is arrested for using the poppet for witchcraft against Abigail, despite Mary Warren's explanations. Hale tries to reassure Proctor, and Proctor rounds on him and calls him cowardly. Hale says that Proctor, Francis Nurse and Giles Corey should consider that they're being punished for some sort of abomination or sin in the town of Salem through the arrest of their wives. Proctor then tries to bully Mary Warren into testifying about the poppet and testifying against Abigail. And Proctor decides that he doesn't care if he loses his reputation and is revealed to the town of Salem as an adulterer as long as his wife Elizabeth is finally freed. So some questions to ask yourself before you start uh, engaging with Act 2 is, do you read the play as a battle between Abigail and Elizabeth for the soul of John Proctor? And if so, who can you see is winning uh, during this scene? Do Proctor's feelings for Abigail change during the course of this scene? If Proctor's feelings do change, why do they change? Do Hale's feelings about the witchcraft trials change? And if so, why? So some important themes that we're going to look at in this act. Um, the battle between Abigail and Elizabeth, as I said, for the soul of John Proctor. You can actually see that this play is structured like a medieval morality play, where you've got a battle between the forces of good, represented by Elizabeth, and the forces of evil, represented by Abigail, for the soul of a good man, which is John Proctor. 
the continued underestimation of children and their power and capacity for evil, which leads to increasing charges of witchcraft. Um, Miller's satirization of the evidence used in the witchcraft trial, which is obviously linked to the way that he satirizes the evidence used in the McCarthy trials in the USA of the 1950s. Um, the importance of reputation and how reputation, a good reputation, often comes at the cost of a person's integrity, which is linked to the motives for the witchcraft accusations. Um, and all of this is based on that dualistic worldview that the Puritans had, where they very simplistically divided the world into good and evil, right and wrong, light and dark, heaven and hell. And this made them vulnerable to the witchcraft trials and accusations. Obviously, this is linked to the idea of who has power in Salem, who doesn't have power, and how power is manipulated for various people's evil ends. The manipulation of power results in an inversion or turning upside down of the traditional social order, which I'll explain in more detail. And Miller satirizes the danger of a person, particularly like Hale, having faith in their faith. And we also see that behind reality, there are hidden truths. There are layers of reality. Um, and it comes back to that idea that Mrs. Putnam proposed of wheels within wheels and fires within fires. So important imagery that we will be dealing with in the play is animal imagery. So, for example, um, there is the imagery of the rabbit in the beginning, and that's contrasted with the idea of good women who are actually the devil's bitch, and obviously a bitch is a female dog. Seasonal imagery, where the imagery of spring is contrasted with the imagery of winter, and obviously that's linked to imagery of hot versus cold, and also light versus dark, heaven versus hell, Okay, which ties into the idea of the battle between the supernatural forces of good and evil. Um, and that, as again, is linked into to the contrasting color imagery of white versus black, and often red, which is frequently associated with hell. And then there's a new image, which is the idea of Abigail, who's kind of playing a devilish Cupid figure, and the arrow that she has lodged into John Proctor. There's also a lot of biblical imagery in this scene, uh, sorry, in this act. And all of the biblical imagery ties into this idea of a battle between the supernatural forces of good and evil. So there is the, the story of Moses parting the Red Sea. There is the story of Lucifer being cast out of heaven for rebellion against God. There is the story of St. Peter being given the keys to the kingdom of heaven. And there is the story of Pontius Pilate and how he denied all responsibility for the crucifixion of Christ. And all of these stories are used symbolically. The play opens with, uh, in, in a completely different setting to Act One. So here the setting is again in a Puritan household, but this is Proctor's common room. It's his living room. And by contrast to the enormously tense atmosphere upstairs in Paris's home where Betty was lying catatonic, here we've got a peaceful domestic scene. Elizabeth is singing softly. There's food cooking on the fireplace. Um, and although we've got a kettle boiling over a stove, just like Abigail's cauldron in the forest, this time it is cooking food that is to welcome Elizabeth's husband, John, when he comes in from the farm. So we meet Elizabeth Proctor in Act 2. And immediately we see this battle between Abigail and Elizabeth for John Proctor's soul. And we can see that there is enormous tension in their relationship. So when Proctor comes into the house, he's been out on the farm, he's been planting uh, all day, he says he's been far out at the forest edge. He secretly flavors the food because he tastes it and he doesn't like the taste. He adds a bit of salt. Um, but when Elizabeth, when Elizabeth asks him if he likes the food, he compliments her and says it's well flavored. He doesn't actually tell her that he flavored it because he can't be honest with her. You see that he asks her a lot of questions about how she's feeling and um, her day at home, and she gives him very, very short monosyllabic answers. So you get the sense that she's either angry or very sad. Um, 
And then when he talks to her, he implies criticism of her. So he says to her, you ought to bring some flowers in the house. It's winter in here yet. Um, but then he offers to take her for a walk on Sunday to pick the flowers. So you can see this contrast between the idea of the home being like winter, it's cold. And remember the cold is often associated with Elizabeth because it's associated with purity, but it's not very welcoming. And then outside of his home is spring and um, the growth of new life and the birth of new possibilities. So we sense we're on a tipping point. Things could go either way for John and Elizabeth Proctor, which is why uh, Miller also mentions the setting outside of their home. He says that the lilacs are blossoming, that it's springtime. Proctor describes how lilacs have a purple smell and Massachusetts is a beauty in the spring. And then of course that's contrast with, with his idea of you ought to bring some flowers in the house. It's winter in here yet. So he's basically saying to Elizabeth, she needs to warm up. She needs to make his home more welcoming. And perhaps at this point, he is still thinking a little bit of Abigail. Um, then uh, Elizabeth starts talking about how the rabbit that they're eating was a rabbit that actually walked into the house. And we've got to wonder why Miller decided to introduce this little subplot of the rabbit. And think about what that rabbit might symbolize. So we know that it just walked into the house, that it was completely and utterly defenseless. It just sat there um, and it allowed Elizabeth to capture it. And then she said it, it, it made her heart sore. It really hurt her because she's got a soft heart that she had to kill and skin, which she says, strip it. So if you're thinking about what that rabbit could represent, it perhaps represents the idea of an innocent victim. And it foreshadows what is going to happen to Elizabeth, that Elizabeth is an innocent victim, that there are many innocent victims of the witchcraft trials that are utterly defenseless. And it perhaps also represents the idea of an innocent victim who is betrayed, particularly Elizabeth, because she has been betrayed by John Proctor. And also, as it becomes clear throughout the scene, because John Proctor had an affair with Abigail, um, that is the reason that Abigail is trying to murder Elizabeth. So not only has John Proctor committed adultery, he has actually provoked the murder of his own wife or the attempted murder of his own wife. So we see this battle continue as the, as the, the act progresses. Um, Proctor goes on and asks Elizabeth if she's sad again, which implies that she's more or less permanently depressed. Um, and Elizabeth, you can see, is suspicious of John Proctor. So um, in the text it says, Elizabeth is suspicious. She doesn't want friction and yet she must. And she says to him, you come so late, I thought you'd gone to Salem this afternoon. So she's implying that she thinks that he might still be continuing with his affair with Abigail. And not without reason. We know that eight days before this, he was alone in a room with Abigail and he was flirting with her. And Proctor gets very defensive. He says, why? I have no business in Salem. So you want to be asking yourself, how honest is Proctor actually being with Elizabeth? Um, and they immediately change the subject because their relationship is so tense. And Proctor looks around and he demands to know where Elizabeth, oh, sorry, where Mary Warren is. And he gets very cross with Elizabeth because she's allowed Mary Warren to go into town and to testify at the witchcraft trials. And um, he says to her, why don't you stop her? She's, she, you know, I can't, can't believe that you're afraid to say no to Mary Warren. And Elizabeth Proctor says of Mary Warren, it is a mouse no more. I forbid her go. And she says to me, I must go to Salem, Goody Proctor. I am an official of the court. And when Proctor says that Mary Warren must be mad to think that people will be hanged for witchcraft, Elizabeth responds with, I would to God she were. There be 14 people in the jail now, she says. And Proctor sim simply looks at Elizabeth, unable to grasp this. So you can see that Proctor still underestimates what Mary Warren and Abigail are capable of. He still thinks that he can control them, he can dictate to them, he can be a powerful, dominating male figure that they will listen to. And of course, this ties in um, with... Uh, that continued theme of the underestimation of children. 
And Elizabeth Proctor tries to highlight how dangerous Abigail has become. She says um, that Mary Warren has told her, she, speak of Abigail, and I thought you were a saint to hear her. Abigail brings the other girls into the court, and where she walks, the crowd will part like the sea for Israel. And f and folks are brought before them, and if they scream and howl and fall to the floor, the person's clapped in jail for bewitching them. Of course, um, Elizabeth is touching on biblical imagery here. She's talking about the story of the parting of the Red Sea. So in the Old Testament in the Bible, when the Israelites were enslaved by the Egyptians and they wanted to escape, God, through his servant Moses, parted the Red Sea so that they could escape in safety. And of course, the sea closed on the, Isra on the Egyptians behind them. So this story presents Abigail as a saintly figure, as a leader of her people, who's going to save her people from evil. Of course, Elizabeth says Abigail is like a saint, like the Israelites. I don't think she really believes that Abigail is actually like a saint. She's being very ironic and very sarcastic in her description of Abigail here. So Elizabeth um, says to John Proctor that he really needs to go to Salem. She says, I think you must go to Salem, John. And he turns to her. I think so. You must tell them it is a, it is a fraud. But of course, Proctor is reluctant. And if you think about the reasons he's reluctant, firstly, he has not been completely honest with his wife. He's told her that he hasn't left the farm, that he has never been alone with Abigail, but he heard that it were that what the children were doing in the forest was only sport from Abigail when he was alone with her. And now he's forced to actually confess to Elizabeth. So he says, I'm only wondering how I may prove what she told me, Elizabeth. If the girl's a saint now, I think it's not easy to prove she's fraud and the town gone so silly. She told me in a room alone. I have no proof for it. So those are his other reasons. He, doesn't, he worries that the town won't believe him. And secondly, that he has no proof because there were no witnesses to this conversation. And as I said, he had lied when he had said he hadn't been alone with Abigail. And Elizabeth also highlights the fact that he's probably very reluctant to hurt Abigail. He still has feelings for her. So um, Proctor then gets very angry with Elizabeth and he says to her, I have gone tiptoe in this house all seven months since she is gone. I have not moved from here to there without, I think, to please you. And still an everlasting funeral marches around your heart. I cannot speak, but I am doubted. Every moment judged for lies. And of course, this is somewhat ironic because one would think that Elizabeth is entitled to not trust him and to be angry with him. He committed adultery for six months under her roof with her servant without her knowing. Um, he only uh, acknowledged it when Elizabeth actually got suspicious. And he has been into Salem and visited Abigail. Even though he hasn't continued with their affair, he still clearly has feelings with her. So he hasn't um, moved from here to there without thinking of Elizabeth's feelings. And um, she probably is entitled to be sad and depressed. Um, so you've got to ask yourself, is his anger actually justified? And perhaps also, why is he so angry? Because he's the one that's ultimately in the wrong. And Elizabeth sees that Proctor is actually angry at himself. Remember, Proctor is a man who cannot tolerate hypocrisy. And he feels that he is a complete hypocrite who has lost his own integrity. So Elizabeth says to Proctor, I do not judge you. The magistrate sits in your heart that judges you. You can see that she has a very good insight into people. She understands Abigail and she understands her own husband. And she knows why he's being so defensive and angry. He's actually angry at, at himself. Um, again, we see some of the, the, the imagery that comes through because Proctor responds to Elizabeth with, Oh, Elizabeth, your justice would freeze beer. And of course, ironically, he's using Abigail's words from Act 1. Remember, Abigail said to Proctor that Elizabeth was a cold, sniveling woman. So you can see that Abigail is, in a sense, speaking through Proctor here. He's, he's got her in his head. And we see that Elizabeth is associated again with cold, winter, purity, the forces of heaven, goodness, justice, you know, all very good stuff, but not particularly um, inviting or, um, 
I suppose, sexually attractive. And um, remember that Abigail told Proctor that he was no wintry man. So you can see how Abigail in Act 1 was using her language to basically split the Proctors to cause division in this relationship. Right, then Mary Warren comes in, and as Proctor and Elizabeth are at the height of their argument, and again we can see how they, um, com how Proctor completely underestimates the power of children, and he doesn't realize who has power in Salem, who doesn't, and how power is being gained. So when Mary Warren comes in, his first response, because he's feeling threatened, because he's angry with himself, is he rounds on Mary Warren, he shouts at her, and he threatens to whip her. And for the for the rest of this part of the act, Mary Warren basically manipulates the proctors. So she starts off by looking for sympathy and saying that she's sick. She's devastated by the work she's had to do in Salem. She very quietly reminds Proctor that she's a powerful court official, and she makes sure that she points out that since she left that morning, the number of women arrested by the court has grown from 14 women to 39. So that's 14 women to 39 in the space of a single day. She implies that Elizabeth is vulnerable and that she has power over Elizabeth and that the proctors should be good to her and she'll be good to the proctors because she gives Elizabeth a poppet, a little rag doll, and she says to her, we must all love each other now, goody proctor. And then she goes on and describes how she has been in court and she testified against Goody Osborne. You remember Goody Osborne that was named as a witch at the end of Act 1? And here you can see how Miller is satirizing the completely ridiculous evidence that's presented in the court. So Mary Warren explains how Goody Osborne's always mumbled. And whenever Goody Osborne came to the house to beg for food, she mumbled. And Elizabeth says, well, she would mumble. She's old and she's ill and she's half mad. And Mary Warren said, yes, that's what she thought. When she went into court, she was determined not to testify against Goody Osborne. She felt sorry for her. But then she remembered she had actually been bewitched. And you can imagine the proctors going, what? And she explained. She said, after, their, after her last visit to the Proctor household, where Mary Warren had asked, um, sorry, where Goody Osborne had asked Mary Warren for food, Mary Warren had an upset stomach for two days. She said, um, uh, she walked away and I thought my guts would burst for two days after. And Elizabeth says, and? And Mary Warren argues, well, that was because she was mumbling curses. She actually bewitched me. That's why I got sick. And then when um, the, the court asked for further um, proof, they said to Goody Osborne, um, what were you mumbling? Goody Osborne said, no, I was simply saying her com my commandments. So the judge in the court asked her to repeat her commandments, and she couldn't. And, of course, Eliz Elizabeth says, but maybe she couldn't because she's old. And, you know, obviously she would have been very scared as well. Maybe she just didn't know her commandments. But how is this proof that she's actually a witch? And um, Mary Warren makes the completely ridiculous statement that the judge said, it's hard proof, hard as rock. And it's on this basis that Goody Osborne has been found guilty of witchcraft and she's going to be hanged. It's purely circumstantial, um, coincidental evidence that actually makes no real sense when you analyze it in detail. And of course, this is what this kind of evidence had in common with much of the evidence that was presented against so-called communists in the 1950s during the McCarthy trials. What's equally ridiculous is the fact that Sarah Good is pardoned because, firstly, she confessed, and she confessed to the most ridiculous things, dancing with the devil, signing her name in his book with her blood, giving him his soul, and then, secondly, she's pregnant. And Mary Warren says, yes, isn't it amazing? She's pregnant, and she's nearly 60, and she doesn't have a husband, which just goes to show that Mary Warren is actually incredibly foolish and incredibly naive. And it also shows just how gullible everyone was that actually believed the so-called evidence in these trials. And Mary Warren carries on manipulating the, proc the proctors because Proctor naturally loses his temper all over again. And when he threatens to whip Mary Warren, she goes to 
um, her last resort in terms of defense, and she threatens Elizabeth. So this is how it happens. Mary backing away from him, but keeping her erect posture, striving, striving for her way. The devil's loose in Salem, Mr. Proctor. We must discover where he's hiding. Proctor, I'll whip the devil out of you. With whip raised, he reaches out for her and she streaks away and yells. Mary points at Elizabeth. I saved her life today. And you can imagine the stunned silence because then the Proctors realize that um, Elizabeth has actually been named in court. She hasn't been accused, but Mary Warren says she's been somewhat mentioned. And then Mary Warren capitalizes on her power. She reminds them that four judges and the king's deputy sat to dinner with us but an hour ago. The subtext is, I'm very important. I'm very powerful. Don't mess with me. I, I would have you speak civilly to me from this, from this out. And then there's that ridiculous conversation where Proctor says, fine then, good night, go to bed. And she says, I don't want to go to bed. I am a woman and 18, however single. So he says, fine then. Don't go to bed. Sit up. And she says, I do want to bed. So he, go to bed. So he says, okay, good night then. And she goes to bed. And she goes to bed dissatisfied because she's been trying to control the proctors, but she doesn't quite get it right. But she certainly has gained power. So Elizabeth at this point realizes how much danger she's in. And she uses this very powerful image of a noose waiting for her. And she understands what Abigail's trying to do. And she explains it to Proctor. She says, oh, the noose, the noose is up. She wants me dead. I knew all week it would come to this. She will cry me out until they take me. And Elizabeth tells Proctor that he doesn't understand young girls. She basically tells him that he's completely underestimated and misunderstood Abigail. And because of this, she implies she is now potentially going to be hanged for witchcraft. So she says delicately, John, grant me this. You have a faulty understanding of young, young girls. There is a promise made in any bed. And Proctor's furious. What promise? Because he basically wants to know, what are you implying about me? What promise do you think I made to Abigail? And Elizabeth explains to Proctor what Abigail is about. She says, it is her dearest hope, John, I know it. And of course, Abigail's dearest hope is that Elizabeth will be dead and Abigail can take her place as Proctor's wife. There be a thousand names. Why does she call mine? There be a certain danger in calling such a name. I am no goody good that sleeps in ditches, nor Osborne drunk and half-witted. She dare not call out such a farmer's wife, but there be a monstrous prophet in it. She thinks to take my place, John. And Proctor can't believe it. So... She cannot think it. And then, of course, Miller's stage directions. He knows it is true. So this is the moment of truth for Proctor. He realizes that the woman he's been having an affair with is out to murder his wife. And you can see how Abigail has shifted the power dynamic in Salem. She's almost turned it upside down. So right at the top, you've got Paris, the Putnams, Abigail, Betty, Mary, the girls. So everyone who is basically testifying um, against so-called witches. Then you've got John Proctor, the Corys, and the nurses. And then beneath them, you've got Elizabeth Proctor. Beneath them still is Tichiba because she is a slave and um, because of her, her skin color. She never gets much power. And then right at the bottom, you've got the social outcasts who are completely vulnerable to accusations of witchcraft. And of course, you can see how reputation and reputation is actually the currency of power. The better your reputation is, the more power you've got. Um, but ironically, that reputation comes at the cost of integrity. So Elizabeth asks Proctor about Abigail. John, have you ever shown her somewhat of contempt? She cannot pass you in the church, but you will blush. Notice the word blush associated with red, associated with hell and lust and passion and Abigail. Okay, so more color imagery. And um, Proctor is furious because, again, he thinks that Elizabeth is implying that he's still having an affair with Abigail, that he made a promise to Abigail that he would get rid of Elizabeth and, and, and be with Abigail. And Elizabeth 
basically says to her, well, if you, if you are over this relationship, then go and tell her she's a whore. Whatever promise she may sense, break it, John, break it. So go and explicitly tell her that you only had sex with her because you were simply attracted to her. It was, it was just about sex, that you had no feelings for her, you made no commitment to her, you basically used her like a prostitute, and that basically that's all she is. And Proctor rounds on her in a rage with his rifle in his hand. I will curse her hotter than the oldest cinder in hell, but pray begrudge me not my anger. So again, he uses this imagery to link Abigail to hell. And of course, um, Elizabeth is, 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 is sort of asks him, well, why, why your anger? Why are you angry? You're not the person that's about to be hanged. You're not the person that had someone commit adultery behind their back. She doesn't say that. She implies it. And Proctor explains his rage. Woman, am I so base? Do you truly think me base? Then how do you charge me with such a promise? Because base means um, immoral, uh, morally degenerate. Do you think that I am so evil that I would actually have promised to get rid of you so that Abigail could take your place? That's what he's asking her. And then he says what the promise was between him and Abigail. The promise that a stallion gives a mare I gave that girl. In other words, it was just about sex. There was nothing more to it. And he explains, he's angry because it speaks deceit and I am honest. But I'll plead no more. I see now your spirit twists around the single era of my life and I will never set it free. So basically, you think I'm deceitful and I'm honest. Of course, that is rich with irony because he did have a six-month affair. He hasn't been entirely honest about his feelings towards Abigail or the fact that he was alone with her. And um, Elizabeth is naturally still um, sad and suspicious because he committed adultery. Um, so if we look at the imagery, again, just remember that the blush and the oldest cinder in hell, these are images of fire and heat, which are continually associated with Abigail. And of course, it's in opposition to the imagery associated with Elizabeth of freezing and cold and heaven. And of course, he also uses Abigail's imagery because Abigail in Act 1 said to him, I know you clutched my back behind your house and sweated like a stallion whenever I come near. And here he says to her, um, the promise that a stallion gives a mare, I gave that girl. So even though he's claiming that he doesn't think of Abigail anymore, he's over their relationship, in a very real sense, she's still in his head. He's still using her language. Um, and of course, this is the high point of the battle between Abigail and Elizabeth. And, and Elizabeth points out that John Proctor will never actually be free until he has stopped having feelings for Abigail and until he no longer is in love with her and he finally sees her for what she really is. And she says to him, um, when he says, I see now your spirit twists around the single era of my life and I will never tear it free. She says, you'll tear it free when you come to know that I will be your only wife or no wife at all. She has an arrow in you yet, John Proctor, and you know it well. So it's Abigail that has actually inflicted the wound on Proctor. And of course, Abigail here has been compared to Cupid, the god of love. Okay. Um, and her arrow is seen as a weapon in this battle between um, Abigail and Elizabeth, between hell and heaven, between evil and good. And that's why I included that picture on the bottom right-hand corner of the skull with the arrow through its head, because basically that is John Proctor. He has been wounded by Abigail's arrow, and um, she is stuck in his head, and she's fatal. It's because of his relationship with her that he and his wife are, are doomed. So 
things to think about. What promise does John Proctor think Elizabeth thinks he made Abigail? Well, he thinks that Elizabeth thinks that she promised that he promised he would get rid of her and replace her with Abigail. Is Proctor honest with himself and Elizabeth when he talks about his feelings for Abigail? He's clearly not honest with Elizabeth, but I think perhaps he's also not honest with himself. He can't face the fact that he is still um, emotionally committing adultery. He's still attracted to her. Why is Proctor so angry with Elizabeth? Perhaps because she sees him too clearly. She sees him for what he is, a man that is actually a hypocrite in his own eyes. And the real reason for his anger, he's angry with himself. Okay, then Hale arrives, because Hale has got a real talent for arriving at the moment of highest tension when people are fighting. Remember in Act 1, he arrived when everyone in Salem was fighting. Now he arrives when the proctors are fighting. And um, the proctors are immediately nervous because they know that Elizabeth has been named in the court. She hasn't been accused, but she's been named. They know that Hale works with the court, so they're wondering, is he here to actually accuse her of witchcraft? They find out that Rebecca Nurse has also been named, although at this stage Hale seems quite confident that the court will find her innocent because she has such a good reputation. And then Hale starts questioning the proctors to find out how good uh, they are in terms of their Christianity. So he questions the fact that Proctor's been missing church services on a regular basis. And Proctor explains his wife was sick after the birth of their third child. Um, he had a lot of work to do on the farm. He couldn't leave home to go to church. He prayed at home. And he's told that's not the same thing as praying in the meeting house. He finds out that one of Proctor's three sons is not baptized. And Proctor again explains that the reason he, he hasn't had his third son baptized is he actually cannot stand Paris and he talks about how Paris is so materialistic that he wasn't even happy with the pewter candlesticks that Francis Nurse had made for the meeting house he demanded golden candlesticks which to Proctor is very much reminiscent of the Catholic Church that the Puritans had rebelled against remember that the Puritans were anti um loads of decoration and riches in churches they saw that as as materialistic and of the devil. And he says that um, sometimes Paris seems to dream cathedrals, not clapboard meeting houses. And um, golden candlesticks at Paris's elbows hurt his prayer. Um, and Proctor says, I like it not that Mr. Paris should lay his hand upon my baby. I see no light of God in that man. I'll not conceal it. And Hale says, I must say it, Mr. Proctor, that is not for you to decide. The man's ordained, therefore the light of God is in him. And of course, here we are seeing that dualistic worldview um, that made the people of Salem so vulnerable to these trials. They can only see the world in terms of black and white, good and evil. And for them, if someone is ordained as a minister, he must be God's man. Therefore, he must be good. Therefore, he cannot actually do anything evil. And that's one of the reasons that they never suspect Paris or his motives. He's head of the church, therefore he represents God. And it's one of the major weaknesses of theocracy that is, is satirized. Um, Hale then goes on to test Proctor's knowledge of the commandments. And Proctor stumbles through all of them, and there's one he cannot remember. And of course, ironically, the one he can't remember is adultery. And a modern psychologist would say it's because he is so angry at himself for committing adultery. He's basically suppressing the memory. And Elizabeth delicately reminds him, adultery, John. And Proctor, as though a secret arrow had pained his heart, says, I, you see, sir, between the two of us, we do know them all. I think it be a small fault, to which Hale responds, theology, sir, is a fortress. No crack in a fortress may be accounted small. And of course, we can see this is a return to that imagery of Abigail having a secret arrow in John Proctor. Um, and when he's re reminded by his wife, Elizabeth, that he's forgotten about the commandment for adult about against adultery, it rekindles his guilt. And of course, when Hale talks about theology or the belief in God being a fortress, this is also part of that imagery that sets up um, this idea of heaven and hell being in a battle. 
Okay. So then Proctor finally decides that he's got to speak up against Abigail. He's beginning to see the light. He's beginning to see that Abigail is actually evil. So Proctor tells Hale that Abigail had told him, that's Proctor, that witchcraft never really happened. Of course, we know that at the time when Abigail said that, she was actually lying, which is, is an irony. Um, Hale wants to know why Proctor hadn't testified about this previously, and Proctor points out that he never thought that the courts would be believing um, these accusations made by children. He says, I never thought, I never knew until tonight that the world has gone daft with this nonsense. And of course, the use of the word nonsense is probably unwise because Hale has great pride in his ability to detect witchcraft. And um, so Hale immediately doubts Proctor and he doesn't believe him in his testimony that uh, uh, Abigail had said this. And of course, Proctor said that he had no witnesses because Abigail told him when they were alone, which doesn't help. So Hale says, nonsense? Mister, I myself examined Tichiba, Sarah Good, and numerous others that have confessed to dealing with the devil. They have confessed it. And of course, Proctor points out the fundamental flaw with all of these witchcraft accusations, and indeed the fundamental flaw with the accusations in the McCarthy trials. And why not, if they must hang for denying it? There are them that will swear to anything before they hang. Have you thought of that? And he's basically pointing out um, the problem with collecting evidence when you collect it under duress, when you intimidate people or threaten them or even torture them, is that you're not going to get accurate evidence. People are going to tell you what you want to hear because they want the pain to stop. And, of course, Hale, this has occurred to Hale, and we can see that Hale is starting to doubt the trials as well, and he's doubting his own faith because he says, I have, I have indeed. It is his own suspicion, but he resists it. And Proctor explains his reluctance to testify and his doubt in the court. Because um, Hale says, do you falter here? And Proctor says, I falter nothing. But I may wonder if my story will be credited in such a court. I do wonder on it. When such a steady-minded minister as you will suspicion a woman that never lied and cannot, and the world knows she cannot. So if you're prepared to suspect Elizabeth, um, how can I think that you might actually listen to anything I have to say um, and give it any kind of credibility. So Elizabeth then goes on to say that she cannot believe in witches if it means that she can be accused of witchcraft. And of course, this is one of the occasions where Elizabeth's honesty actually causes trouble because at this point, Hale might have believed that Abigail had been lying when she said that witchcraft had occurred. And then Elizabeth um, turns around and says she doesn't believe in witchcraft. And Elizabeth says to, to Hale, I cannot think that the devil may own a woman's soul, Mr. Hale, when she keeps an upright way as I have. I am a good woman. I know it. And if you believe I may, only do, may do only good work in the world and yet be secretly bound to Satan, then I must tell you, sir, I do not believe it. And of course, this was one of the most ridiculous aspects of the witchcraft trials, that the better someone's behavior seemed to be the, the the better their character seemed to be the more it was taken as evidence that not that they were a good person but that they were particularly cunning and sly and good at hiding their evil and um elizabeth is simply saying she thinks that these trials are completely illogical but of course what hale is hearing is that she doesn't believe in the bible therefore she's potentially a witch she also makes her dislike and distrust of abigail very honest uh, very obvious and ironically this can later be used as evidence against her because she's saying she doubts the court's star witness and of course one of the things that the courts are increasingly going to do is try to prove the honesty of their witnesses rather than searching for truth so elizabeth says question abigail williams about the gospel not myself and hale stares at her you know he's wondering what kind of woman is this? And Proctor is horrified. He knows how Elizabeth's outbursts might be interpreted and used against her. At this point, Francis Nurse and Giles Corey arrive and they explain that their wives have been arrested and the completely ridiculous evidence used against them. And again, this evidence is being satirized. 
So Rebecca Nurse was arrested for the marvelous and supernatural murder of Goody Putnam's babies. Now, this is a woman who has had many, many children of her own, many grandchildren, has a reputation for loving children, and is very good with them. And yet, the people of Salem are prepared to believe that she might have murdered children. Martha Corey was arrested because she sold a pig to a man called George Walcott, and the pig subsequently died. And the whole basis for that arrest... When she sold the pig to George Walcott, she told him he's such a bad farmer that no pig he ever owns is going to live for very long because he doesn't feed them properly, he doesn't look after them properly. Of course, then the pig died, and this was twisted into Martha Corey must have cursed him. That's why the pig died. Therefore, Martha Corey is a witch. So again, you can see how this evidence was completely and utterly ridiculous, but also how believing that the world was so absolutely divided into good and evil made the people of Salem incredibly vulnerable. So we've got to ask ourselves, why did the people of Salem believe these girls and their ridiculous accusations? Well, remember their worldview. They believed absolutely that the devil was a figure of evil personified that went around the world trying to steal away the souls of people um, to throw them into hell. And in opposition to the devil, there were the forces of good and angels. So they saw the world as being the battleground for these supernatural forces. Um, and of course, that meant that they saw the world in very absolute terms. There was no, no room for um, interpretation or gray areas in their vision of the world. They also completely underestimated children. So as far as they were concerned, children were powerless and children were usually innocent. And if they weren't innocent, what they did wasn't usually that bad. They couldn't believe that children were capable of this level of evil. So, um, and we can see this, this worldview in Hale's response to Francis Nurse. So when Nurse is getting very upset about the arrest of Rebecca, Hale says to, her, says to him, Nurse, though our hearts break, we cannot flinch. These are new times, sir. There is a misty plot afoot so subtle, we should be criminal to cling to old respects and ancient friendships. I have seen too many frightful proofs in court. The devil is alive in Salem, and we dare not quail to follow wherever the accusing finger points. So even though you might have known someone for your entire life, you might have seen nothing but decades of perfect behavior, kindness, good works, they can still work for the devil. Why? Because the devil is really crafty and he's good at hiding what he does. That's the basic argument. And it's a very hard one to disprove. So Proctor is furious and he says to Hale, how may such a woman, here he's talking about Rebecca Nurse, murder children? And Hale says, and this is the explanation that they came up with, man, remember until an hour before the devil fell, God thought him beautiful in heaven. So basically, if God could be tricked by the devil, surely human beings can. And of course, the story behind this is that um, the devil was one of the most beautiful and powerful angels in in the whole of heaven. His name, Lucifer, comes from the Latin word lux, meaning light, because he was so beautiful. And he rebelled against God and was thrown out of heaven along with the other rebel angels. Um, and the point of the story is that God did not suspect the devil right up until the point where he rebelled. So Hale's argument is we can very easily be tricked by our neighbors if the devil could trick God. So even God has been deceived. And at this point, Cheva arrives and he starts questioning the proctors. Now, Cheva is a town tailor. And again, it comes back to this point. He's now the clerk of the, co the court, even though his normal profession is sewing trousers and shirts. Um, he's known the proctors for years, but he's now prepared to believe that they might be witches. And he starts questioning Elizabeth about poppets. He finds a poppet and he arrests Elizabeth. So we've got to ask ourselves, what's the big deal about poppets? What signifies a poppet in Proctor's words? So poppets were dolls made out of cloth. Usually they were just toys. But the Puritans believed that if you had a poppet that represented a person and you cast the right spells and used the right magic, 
if you damaged the puppet, which was also sometimes called a witch doll, you would then damage the person that the puppet represented. Um, originally, this belief in puppets was thought to have originated in voodoo religion, which was practiced in places like Barbados and, ha and Haiti, which might be why um, there is perhaps they thought there was some sort of link to Tichiba. But actually, it was never a voodoo religious belief at all. It actually came out of European witchcraft beliefs and practices. So anyway, Mary Warren um, explains how she put the needle into the puppet when she was finished sewing it in, in court. And um, that she gave the, the puppet to Elizabeth as a gift. And the only reason she put the needle into the puppet was just for safekeeping. It was a perfectly innocent explanation. And Hale immediately suggests that maybe her memory was manipulated by witchcraft. So you can see how he's leading this investigation towards a conclusion that this puppet was actually used for witchcraft. Hale watches Mary Warren closely. Child, you are certain this be your natural memory. May it be perhaps that someone conjures you even now to say this. And Mary says, conjures me? Why no, sir, I'm entirely myself, I think. Let you ask Susanna Walcott. She saw me sewing it in court. Or better still, ask Abby. Abby sat beside me when I made it. And of course, this is when alarm bells should go off in your head. Abigail saw Mary Warren sewing the puppet. Abigail saw Mary Warren putting the needle inside the puppet. So here you can see there are actually two versions of the truth. Okay, Mary Warren says she sat in court next to Abigail. She sewed a puppet for Elizabeth. Abigail saw her sewing. When Mary was finished, she pushed the needle into the puppet for safekeeping and she forgot about it. And we know that Abigail, having as she was sitting there, might have actually noticed this. When Mary Warren got home, she gave the puppet to Elizabeth as a gift. And we know that Abigail would probably have known that the puppet was now going to be in the Proctor's home because Mary Warren works for the Proctor's and she took the puppet home with her. Abigail implies that Elizabeth used the puppet to hurt Abigail. Um, Abigail never sort of explains where that puppet came from. She implies that Elizabeth forced a needle into the puppet's belly and because she was using witchcraft, this forced a needle directly into Abigail's belly while she was dining at dinner. She was at dinner with the deputy governor. Abigail then collapsed in agony, accused El Elizabeth of using witchcraft to hurt her. And that's why Cheva has arrived at the proctor's house in order to arrest um, Elizabeth. Of course, uh, Mary Warren is called in. She explains the whole puppet story. And Hale doesn't believe her, which is one of the supreme ironies of the, of the whole play. So irony, just to remind you, is when the truth of a situation is opposite to what is said or what appears to be true. Um, the truth is that Abigail did commit witchcraft, and ironically, that's never believed. The lie that it were just sport in the forest, ironically, is not believed. Um, Abigail, although she did commit witchcraft, ironically is never prosecuted. Um, arguably, the people that didn't co commit witchcraft, they do get prosecuted. Abigail's witchcraft to kill Elizabeth Proctor, remember she drank a charm of blood to kill her, doesn't work. But ironically, when she charges Elizabeth with witchcraft, which Elizabeth didn't commit, that does work to destroy Elizabeth. The witch doll doesn't actually damage Abigail, Instead, it damages Elizabeth. It's used as evidence against her. So we can see how this whole drama with the poppet is linked to this idea of a supernatural battle and also the imagery of layers of reality and tr truth behind the reality. Remember in Act 1, Mrs. Putnam saying, there are wheels within wheels in this village and fires within fires. So Hale was given convincing evidence that the needle in the poppet had nothing to do with Elizabeth, it had nothing to do with witchcraft, and then Elizabeth loses her temper. And once again, this lands her in um, trouble. As Elizabeth says to Hale, what signifies a needle? At this point, they have no idea what Abigail is charging. And Hale says, Mary, you're charging a cold and cruel murder on Abigail. And Mary's stunned. She says, murder? I charge no... And Hale says, Abigail was stabbed tonight. A needle were found stuck into her belly. 
And of course, um, Elizabeth loses her temper and she, she realizes what Abigail is up to and she shouts out and she charges me and Hale says, I, and Elizabeth's breath is knocked out and she says those fatal words, why the girl is murder, which would have been fine. At that point, Elizabeth was, was clear. She then goes and says, she must be ripped out of the world, which implies to Cheva and Hale that Elizabeth wants to destroy Abigail that Elizabeth is in fact a witch. She has tried to murder Abigail. So Cheever points at Elizabeth and says, you heard that, sir, ripped out of the world. So Elizabeth is then arrested on the basis of Abigail's evidence and Proctor protests. And Proctor's logic is very sound. You know, he highlights the problem with these courts. He says, if she be innocent, here he's talking about Elizabeth, why do you never wonder if Paris be innocent or Abigail? Is the accuser always holy now? Were they born this morning as clean as God's fingers? I'll tell you what's walking Salem. Vengeance is walking Salem. We are what we always were in Salem. But now the little crazy children are jangling the keys of the kingdom and common vengeance writes the law. So he finally gets it. He sees vengeance is the desire for revenge. He realizes that that is behind Abigail's accusations of Elizabeth. She wants revenge. And of course, here he uses some more biblical imagery, again ties in with that idea of a supernatural battle. He talks about how St. Peter was given the keys to the kingdom of heaven by Jesus. And of course, that gave Peter the right to admit people to heaven or send them to hell. But he says, now the little crazy children have been given these keys. And therefore, they have the power of Peter. They can send people to heaven or to hell by what they do or don't testify in court. And of course, it's an inversion or a turning upside down of the old social order. And if you look at how the social order has shifted now, at the top, you've got Abigail and the court officials, then Paris, Putnam and the girls, then the Pro Proctor, John Proctor, Cor the Corys and the nurses, then Elizabeth Proctor, Tichaba, and then the social outcasts. And you can see how Abigail has gone from near the bottom of the pyramid all the way to the top. Um, he also uses the imagery of uh, another biblical image because he rounds on Hale and he calls Hale a coward. And he says to Hale, you are Pontius Pilate. God will not let you wash your hands of this. You are a coward. Though you be ordained in God's own tears, you are a coward now. So Pontius Pilate, remember, washed his hands. He tried to get rid of the responsibility of handing Christ over for crucifixion, even though he knew that Jesus was innocent. So Pilate symbolizes the ultimate moral coward or betrayer of innocence. And of course, um, because he doesn't stand up against Abigail, Elizabeth is then arrested. Proctor is furious. He tears up the court warrant and he gets restrained. Elizabeth tries to make her arrest dignified. She goes calmly, but she faces the ultimate humiliation that her and Francis and, and Rebecca Nurse and Martha Corey are taken away in chains like criminals. Hale refuses to believe that the witchcraft trials could have been caused by Abigail's malice. He says, only this consider, the world goes mad and it profit nothing you should lay the cause to the vengeance of a little girl. So Hale suggests that Salem is being punished by God for a hidden sin. And Proctor considers, you can see him thinking, maybe he's being punished by God for his adultery. Hale says, man, we must look to cause proportionate. Were there murder done, perhaps, and never brought to light? Abomination, some secret blasphemy that stinks to heaven. Think on cause, man, and let you help me to discover it. For there's your way, believe it. There is your only way when such confusion strikes upon the world. And Francis is struck by Hale's mood, and he says, I never heard no murder done in Salem. And Proctor has also been reached by Hale's words, and he just says, leave me. So Giles and Francis leave, and Proctor tries to bully Mary Warren into testifying against Abigail. Mary says Abigail will ruin his reputation by revealing his affair with Abigail. She says, she'll ruin you with it, I know she will. And Proctor, hesitating with a deep hatred of himself, says, good, then her saintliness is done with. And Mary backs from him. We will slide together into our pit. You will tell the court what you know. And Mary says in terror, I cannot, they'll turn on me. And of course, notice 
again, that imagery of a supernatural battle. We've got the saintliness, the, the supposed saintliness of Abigail against the pit. And the pit is a reference to the grave or to hell. Okay. Um, so what um, Proctor is saying here is that finally they are going to be revealed for what they really are. They will no longer have to be hypocrites. So Mary struggles to escape from him and says, I cannot do it. I cannot. And Proctor grasps her by the throat as though he would strangle her. And he says, make your peace with it. Now heaven and hell grapple on our backs and all our old pretense is ripped away. Make your peace. It is a providence and no great change. We are what we always were, but naked now. I naked and the wind, God's icy wind will blow. And um, just notice here that we've got more imagery of a supernatural battle again. Heaven is associated with cold. And Proctor is relieved. His secret is out. He no longer needs to be a hypocrite. And now people can be what they actually are. So a couple of things to think about in this act. Is Proctor actually a tragic hero? Do you still think that Abigail might just be a scared little girl who's defending herself? Or are you thinking she is, in fact, a cold-blooded sociopath? How much power has Abigail actually managed to win in Salem? How much power does Abigail have over John and Elizabeth Proctor? And why do the people of Salem believe Abigail's accusations? Finally, has Hale's attitude to the witchcraft trials changed? And we'll pick up on these ideas when we get into Act 3 in our next session. Thank you.